Question 22. Both type 1A supernova and type 2 supernova are possible final events, right? Choose all statements below which correctly describe. Yeah, so this is again true or false question for each of the statements. So I'll just do that. Okay, both the type 1A supernovas and type 2 supernovas leave behind a remnant of a neutron star. Yeah, um, the textbook was quite explicit on that. Type 1A, so just so we have a correct starting place, type 2 supernova are final place of a very massive, it could be a solitary star. It uh, burned out all the nuclear fuel, it's collapsing, and there's a you know core collapse that forms a neutron star, rebounding material forms a supernova. That's type two supernova. Type 1A supernova can only form in a system that's at least a binary system. You need a primary and you need a companion star. The primary star will go through its cycle, will become red giant and then, um, and then collapse and become a white dwarf. And uh, the white dwarf will still be orbiting with the secondary. The secondary is going through its life cycle. And as the secondary uh, reaches its end stage, as it becomes red, red giant, it's expanding, the material transfer takes place. Some of the material from the red giant the secondary transfers to the gravitational, it transfers to the white dwarf. And as the material accumulates, as some threshold, it um, the the mass uh, becomes above the Chandraska limit, the mass limit for white dwarf. So it undergoes the, the collapse and explosion. That's the type one A supernova. And what the textbook explicitly says is that in type one A supernova, the explosion completely blows away the white dwarf core. The, nothing is left. So, um, so yeah, no remnant of a neutron star for type 1A. So that is not correct, meaning I won't check it. Um, type 1A supernova can only occur with the stars that are yeah, part of a binary or more system. There needs to be a mass transfer from secondary to the primary. Yeah, causes further class, which results in a supernova expanding class. Yeah, that is it. <laughs> um, yeah, type 2 supernova, of course, at the end of a massive star's life, when the core collapse in the runaway fusion reaction blows apart our, well, forming, yeah, this is how we believe all the heavy elements formed because uh, it's energetically not favorable to form any, by fusion, formed by fusion, any elements heavier than iron. So it has to be something non-equilibrium process. Because of its brightness and consistent intrinsic luminosity, time one is supernovas are used as standard candles to, yeah, that is, it's a, uh, greatest usefulness to astronomy and cosmology, frankly. We can see, I think when type 1A supernova goes, um, it, it shines brighter than the host galaxy. So we can see it quite far away. We can estimate distance to other very distant galaxies. Um, because of brand is yeah. So the difference between type two and type 1A supernovas is that the way the type 1A supernova occurs, its brightness is kind of determined by physics. Uh, that's what makes it consistent. With the type two supernovas, not really, because um, it depends on how large the original star was. So I do remember reading somewhere that the light curve of type two supernova uh, can be used to calibrate the intrinsic luminosity, but it's more complicated than the type 1A. So it, it's, uh, so it may be used, but it's not, quite as simple as this. So it, and most importantly, it doesn't have consistent intrinsic luminosity. There may be a way to get at it, but it's not definitely not consistent. Okay, uh, type 1A supernovas and type 2 supernovas, yeah, by lack of hydrogen attrition lines in their spectra. So type 2 supernovas, when they go off, there's going to be the outer layers that contain a lot of hydrogen. They absorb the light. Type 1A supernova, it starts out with that white dwarf core. They already burned off all the hydrogen or fused away or blown away all the hydrogen that could be there. So uh, type 1A supernovas don't have hydrogen absorption lines. So yeah, that's it, true or false. 